My name is Rick Renner, and I'm in ancient Ephesus on Corridus Street, which is one of the oldest and most illustrious streets of the city of ancient Ephesus. 2,000 years ago, each side of the street was lined with covered colonnades with be beautiful mosaic floors, and the whole street was lined with statues of poets, educators, politicians, governors, illustrious citizens. This was really a regal part of the city of Ephesus, and it went right to the library and to where the synagogue once was in the very heart of the city. This is where the gospel just exploded. It boomed. And from here, the gospel went to all of Asia. We believe that not far from here, Timothy was martyred for his faith at the age of 80. Early in his life, Timothy really had to deal with the spirit of fear. And that's why Paul wrote to him in 2 Timothy 1.7 and said, God's not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Well, Timothy so overcame his spirit of fear that later in his life, we believe he came out onto the street to rebuke a pagan parade that was celebrating all kinds of idolatries. Timothy rebuked them. They responded by beating him to death, and he died as a martyr, we believe, on this street at the age of 80. But he overcame his spirit of fear. And by the way, if you deal with the spirit of fear, God did not give you a spirit of fear. But Paul and his team settled down in this city, and here they saw the will of God unfold right in front of them. They had to accept the challenge to come, and likewise, you have to accept the challenge that God has given to you. Maybe he's called you somewhere you didn't expect, or he's asking you to do something that you don't feel you're prepared for, but yet you know it is the call of God. You have to embrace it with all of your heart and rely on the grace of God to equip you, and I promise you, God will equip you to do whatever is His will. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. I've been waiting for you. Today we're going to jump right into Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 to see what Christ had to say to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus was an amazing place. I wish I could pick you up and take you there, just transport you to that ancient site. It is remarkable even today. But in ancient Ephesus, there was the church at Ephesus. It was a powerful church, but it had some problems, and Christ addressed those problems, and he's still speaking those same words to us today. So we need to hear what Christ had to say to the church. But today, we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 and really unpack a lot of amazing revelation in that verse. But first, I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Ephesus. It's a 10-part series based on these programs, but it comes with a marvelous study guide with all the Greek words, the Greek definitions, all the points, the principles that are in these programs. It's perfect for your personal life or study with a friend or with a group, and I really want to encourage you to order it today. And I'm also offering my book called a Light in Darkness, Seven Messages to the Seven Churches. The director of the Pergamum Museum said this. It's written right on the front of the book. One of the most professional books ever produced on this subject. The subject is the seven messages to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. This book is filled with photos, illustrations, and you'll see that every single page is full color. It is just an amazing book. Now, few people sit down and read all 785 pages at once. Most people use it as a reference. They keep it in a visible place. Some people even use it as a coffee table book because it is so beautiful. And they refer to it again and again and again. If you want to understand the context of the New Testament church, read this book. If you want to understand the challenges New Testament believers were facing, read this book. If you want to understand the New Testament, Read this book. It will cause the New Testament to come alive for you. The back of the book says, The message you need to equip you for the days to come. Step into the world of the New Testament as this book transports you into the ancient cities of Ephesus and Smyrna to explain the relevance of Jesus' messages to those churches then and why those messages are still relevant for the church today. It is just a wonderful book, and today I'm going to be reading some from this book. But today, we're going to be focusing on Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, 
But first, I want us to go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Let's begin there. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, we find that the Apostle John, a very elderly man in his early 90s, has been exiled to the Isle of Patmos for his faith. Listen to what he says, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. When John said, I was in the isle, that word was is the Greek word genomai, which carries this idea. Something happened that took me off guard. It completely took me by surprise. A strange series of events that I could have never forecasted, something that I could have never anticipated. Through a strange series of events, I came to find myself in the isle, and the Greek says, being called Patmos. It's very strong in Greek. Everyone knew the name Patmos. I was in the isle, the one being called Patmos. No one wanted to be exiled to Patmos. It was a forbidden place. It was a forsaken place, stripped of all of its foliage, no trees, just a barren rock with only one source of natural water. And John was a political prisoner, so when he was offloaded onto the Isle of Patmos, he was not incarcerated in prison, but was left to roam the island by himself with no food, no water, no clothes, just to fend for himself. And he was in his early 90s. And he ended up living in a cave which today you can still visit. It's called the Cave of the Revelation. And when John was in that cave, he had a revelation, which is now the book of Revelation. And John tells us how this revelation occurred in verse 10. Listen to what he says. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. First of all, the word Lord's Day does not refer to the Sabbath, and it does not refer to Sunday. It is the Greek word kuriakas. The word kuriakas is the word for the imperial day of the emperor. This was the day on which Domitian was worshipped worldwide, empire-wide. So John says on the very day when the rest of the world was worshipping the emperor Domitian, this pagan demented god, that is the very day Jesus, the real emperor, stepped into the cave to pay me a visit. And he tells us how it happened. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, if you're reading the King James Version, the word Spirit is capitalized. But in Greek, there is no capital letter. The Greek actually says, I was in Spirit. Or you could translate it, I was in a spiritual dimension. When John says, I was, it again is the Greek word genomai, which in this verse describes a transition from one realm to another realm. I'm going to say that again. A transition from one realm into another realm. John says, Genomai, I don't know how it happened. I could never replicate it. In some way that I cannot explain, I found myself transitioning from one realm into another realm, and suddenly I found myself, the King James Version says, in the spirit. The Greek says, I transitioned into a different dimension. I found myself in a spiritual dimension. And when he was in that spiritual dimension is when he had his revelation of Jesus Christ and all the revelations contained in the book of Revelation. And the Bible tells us that he heard a great voice as of a trumpet saying, verse 11, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And then the seven churches are listed. Unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamum, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. But the first message was directed to the church of Ephesus. Why was it directed to Ephesus first? Because Ephesus was the first church birthed in all of Asia, and it was the largest, the most notable, the most powerful and influential church in the entire region. Furthermore, Ephesus was considered the light of Asia. It was believed that whatever happened in Ephesus would affect the whole of Asia. That from Ephesus, all the roads went everywhere. Philosophy went from Ephesus to all of Asia. Education went from Ephesus to all of Asia. You know, Christ is very strategic in everything that he does. The gospel first came to Ephesus because from Ephesus, it would go to the whole Asian province. 
Then when you come to chapter 2 and verse 1, and this is where we were in the last program, Christ says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. Yesterday we looked at two words. We looked at the word angel, and we saw that the word angel, the Greek word angelos, does not in this verse describe a heavenly angel. Now the word angelos many times in scriptures does describe heavenly creatures, heavenly angels. But in this particular verse, this word angelos should be translated messenger. And it refers to the messenger of the church, or here it depicts the pastor of the church. And it's very important to point out that when Christ had to say something to the church, he didn't address the message to the church. He addressed it to the pastor. Christ never bypasses spiritual authority. If Christ has a word of commendation to speak to the church, usually the pastor will hear it first. If Christ has a message of rebuke to speak to the church, usually the pastor will hear it first. Then it is the pastor's responsibility to process that message and to transmit it to the congregation. And when you come to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you find that Christ honors the authority that he has set in place. He speaks to the pastor first, then the pastor delivers the message to the congregation. But it says, unto the angel or unto the pastor of the church. We saw that this word church is actually the Greek word ekklesia. And I'm going to read to you directly from my notes. It's a compound of two Greek words, the word ek, which means out. It carries the idea of an exit. And the word kaleo, which means to call or to summon. But when you compound the two words together, it is someone making an exit from society and being called to something different. Therefore, it can be translated a called, separated, and prestigious assembly. It tells us the church is a prestigious place. We are a called and separated people. That's what the word church, ecclesia, means. Historically, this word ecclesia denoted a public assembly of distinguished Athenian citizens. You see, this word ecclesia was most notably used in Athens to describe a distinguished group of Athenian citizens who gathered together regularly, actually about 40 times a year. They determined laws, debated public policy, formulated new policies, argued and ruled in judicial matters. They elected the chief magistrates of the land, they were selected from society, called out from society. They were a body that had great honor. And in the New Testament, it is used to depict body of believers who've been called out from the world, summoned forth by Christ, selected specially, and assembled to be God's representatives in every town, city, or nation. It is a body called to make decisions that affects the atmosphere of an entire region, which means the church is not just the little building on the corner down the street. The church is not a body of believers hiding from the rest of the world. We are called to be God's ruling voice in the state, in the nation, in the city, wherever we find ourselves to be. This word ecclesia was a political word. It described a political body. They met together. They began with prayer, even in Athens, among the pagans. The ecclesia began with prayer. And then they had someone who spoke to them called the kerux. The word kerux is where we get the word for a preacher. All of these words are borrowed from the secular world. So when the Bible calls us the church, we are a powerful people. We're called to affect the atmosphere of our cities, our states, our nations. We are God's ruling voice in the earth. We are a prestigious assembly. That is the first thing we find. But notice what else it says. It says, unto the angel of the church in Ephesus write. Now listen to these words. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The word holdeth is the Greek word kratos. This word kratos describes a masterful grip. Listen careful. A masterful grip to tightly embrace or to hold fast. In other words, whatever you're holding, you're holding it so tight, you're embracing it so strongly, no one can take it away from you. It is in your control. You have a masterful grip over it. Well, what does Christ have in his right hand? The Bible says seven stars. These seven stars in this verse represent the seven pastors of the seven churches. I think it's interesting that in these chapters, pastors are called angels and pastors are called stars. Isn't that interesting? Your pastor is an angel. 
and your pastor is a star. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you what it means. Let's look at this word star, and I want to go to page 107 in this wonderful book that you need to order, and listen to what this means. First of all, the word stars is the Greek word esteros. It, the plural form is used in this verse, and it describes stars just like the stars in the universe. Listen to what I've written on these pages about your pastor, who Jesus says is a star. Why does Christ call pastors stars? Listen to this. These pastors were intended to shine like stars in the spiritual darkness that permeated the region. They were to be guiding lights to the churches. But the pastors of these seven churches were called to shine like stars in order to give guidance to people in darkness. They were to help navigate lost people to Christ. They were to assist believers in worship and teach the word of God so people could learn how to recognize the seasons of life. If these pastors fulfilled their responsibilities, they would indeed become God's guiding lights to their generation, impacting the future and destiny of people under their charge. Like stars in the heavens, even the most bright and shining pastoral ministry is temporary and fading. That's the truth. No pastor lasts forever. Although a pastor may serve in one location for many years, there is no such thing as a permanent pastor. Eventually a time comes when his light begins to fade so a new star can be born. And each time each pastor begins to wind down and prepare for another pastor to take his place and become the new guiding light for that church and community. Wow, there's so much in this word star. Next, the lifespan of a pastor's ministry may be short or long, depending on several factors. One key factor is the amount of spiritual fuel and endurance he has at his core. That's also true of natural stars. How long they work, how long they spend, how long they give light depends on how much fuel they have at their core. Very often, pastors of larger churches have ministries with shorter lifespans because they experience such great pressure at their core which causes them to burn out more quickly. And although it may seem as if pastors with smaller congregations burn less brilliantly or have less impact, they may shine their light longer because they experience less pressure at their core. Wow. The amount of spiritual fuel resident within a pastor, his use of that fuel, and his ability to endure pressure at his core are all critical factors in determining the longevity of his ministry. Or listen to this. Like massive stars, those pastors who have larger congregations run the risk of experiencing pressure at their core if they burn too fast and furiously. Pastors who lead smaller congregations may not shine as brightly in terms of prominence or fame, but they may burn longer because they're not subjected to the incessant pressure at their core the pastors of larger churches often experience. When, what transpires at the core of a pastor's life is what determines his or her brevity or longevity in the ministry. And it just goes on and on and on. Listen to this. Like the 10 billion trillion stars in the universe, no two pastors are exactly alike. God calls some pastors to lead massive churches, others to lead medium-sized churches, and still others to lead smaller churches. Some pastors are called to be bright lights, stars who are well known to the masses, whereas other pastors are called to have less visibility to smaller churches and smaller communities. Regardless of the size of their congregations or ministries, pastors are called to shine their light in a way that is consistent with their own unique calling. This just goes on and on and on. It is amazing why Jesus likened pastors to stars. Your pastor is an angel. You need to treat him like an angel. The Greek word angelos, that's what it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus. He is God's sent minister to you. Furthermore, he is to be a star. His job is to be a guiding light for you, a guiding light for the church, and a guiding light for the congregation. Do you treat your pastor like he's an angel and do you treat him like he's a star? That's who he is. And if you're listening to me today and you're a pastor, quit demeaning yourself and belittling yourself. You are God's messenger. You are to be God's star to your church and to your community. So shine and make sure you use the fuel at your core appropriately so that your ministry is not brief, but it has real longevity. Isn't that amazing? All of that just in this word star. But listen to this.
It says unto the angel of the church in Ephesus, write these things that saith, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Hmm. He's holding the seven stars in his right hand. Listen to what I write on page 399 of this book. Now here Jesus, Kratos, he has a masterful grip. He's holding these stars. These pastors are in his right hand. The word holdeth in Revelation 2.1 is from the word kratos. This word denotes power. It refers to Jesus' control over the pastors. In the context of this verse, it means to have power over, to hold fast, or to have a masterful grip on. The word kratos expresses the fact that Christ masterfully holds pastors in his mighty grip. They are under his control and they are accountable to him. It is important to point out that these pastors were not in the hands of a board of deacons or a pulpit committee. Of course, it's vital for systems of accountability to be developed and be set in place in each local church, that the pastor of each church is called by Jesus and is first and foremost answerable to him. He is in the right hand of Christ. The under-shepherds, the pastors, are the ones held in the masterful grip of the great shepherd, the head of the church, and they are answerable and accountable to him. The pastors are expected to deliver with accuracy and precision Jesus' message to their respective churches. And in this case, it was the seven most influential churches of Asia that existed at that time. Isn't that amazing? Christ holding these pastors in his right hand. Answerable to Christ, in the control of Christ, angels, and stars. That is how important they are that they were in the right hand of Christ. And the verse goes on to say, listen to this. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That word walketh is a Greek word peripateo. Listen to what it means. To walk around, to carry on in one general vicinity. It is the picture of a person who's walked on one path or vicinity for so long that now he can almost walk that path blindfolded. He knows the path because he has habitually lived and functioned there. The word denotes the movement of feet. It suggests one who has walked in one region for so long, it has now become his environment, his place of daily activity. It can be translated to stroll. So here we find Christ. He is place where he permanently walks, regularly walks, is in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which is the church. That is the vicinity where Christ functions. That's why he could say in verse 2, I know your works. He was there all the time. He was moving his feet among the churches. Christ was strolling among the churches, and that's why he could address their problems with such accuracy. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment. The Bible comes to life like never before with Rick Renner's book, A Light in Darkness. Step into the world of the New Testament as Rick Renner transports you to the ancient cities of the early church, revealing the relevance of Jesus' messages to the church then and why those messages still resonate for his church today. Rick reveals insight into the ancient world and the disturbing realities the early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a pagan world with unsurpassed detail fascinating insights and historical context you'll have a greater appreciation and understanding of scripture and how you should interpret it for today this beautifully bound 800 page full color biblical resource can be yours for 80 dollars features on location photography with added artwork and illustrations to enhance the in-depth scriptural teaching that makes the new testament come alive when you call or go online today you can also get christ's message to ephesus an in-depth 10-part teaching series that delves deep into the message Jesus gave to the Ephesian church. The church of Ephesus was a successful church on the outside, but they had drifted from their first love of Jesus. Available in digital or physical format starting at just $20. Rick uses this teaching series to remind you to return to your first love of Jesus. A light in darkness and Christ's message to Ephesus. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Hey friends, Denise and I are coming to an area near you very soon. On Sunday, July 24th, we're coming to Word of Faith International Church, Bishop Keith Butler in Southfield, Michigan. 
On Thursday, July 28th, Denise is having a women's meeting in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. On Sunday, July 31st, we're coming to Covenant Church to be with Jesse and Kathy Duplantis at Destrahan, Louisiana. On Sunday, August the 7th, we're coming to Victory Church to be with Pastor Jeanette Furry in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. On Sunday, August 14th, we're gonna be at Radiant Church with Pastor Lee Cummings in Richland, Michigan. On Sunday, August 21st, we're going to be at Liberty Church in Fairfield, California with Pastor Richard West. On Thursday, August 25th, we're coming to River of Life Fellowship in Seaside, Oregon to be with Pastors Tolbert and Mary Jo Lovelady. On Sunday, August 28th, we're coming to Spokane Christian Center in Spokane, Washington with Pastor Rick Sharkey. On Sunday, September 4th, we're coming to Faith Family Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota to be with Pastors Michael and Vicki Bang. And on Sunday, September the 11th, we're coming to Madison, Alabama to Cornerstone Word of Life to be with Pastor Mark Garver. Please check our website for the most recent updates and information about these wonderful meetings. Today we're looking at Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, where Christ is speaking to the church of Ephesus. And it says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. We've seen that this word angel, the Greek word angelos, which in this particular context described the pastor of the church. Angels, heavenly angels, heavenly creatures were never assigned the responsibility to teach, to preach, or to correct local churches. That is a human responsibility which is given to the pastor of the church. And in this particular verse, the word angelos should be translated messenger, and it refers to the pastor of the church. He says, under the angel of the church, we saw that word church, is the Greek word ekklesia. It describes a prestigious body of believers called out from the world, summoned forth to rule and reign. We are a people with ruling power, called by God to affect our cities and our nations. But it goes on to say, these things saith he that holdeth, the seven stars in his right hand. And we've seen that this word holdeth, the Greek word kratos, describes a masterful grip. Christ has these pastors in his right hand. They are answerable to him and they are accountable to him. And then we go on to see Christ was walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And that's where we're going to begin in the next program. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Ephesus. Order it. It's 10 parts. It comes in multiple formats. And we're also offering my book called The Light in Darkness, Seven Messages to the Seven Churches. But I want to pray for you. Father, thank you so much for the privilege that we can meet together every day to study the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for this awesome honor. I pray for your blessing to come into my friend's life. We pray for their pastor who is an angel and who is a star. Bless them. Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's word release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. 